expert from uh, Penn State University, which will uh, present his work uh, uh, that uh, is in part a collaboration uh, with uh, the census and done with the public. Okay, thank you. I'm glad to be here. So I'll talk about uh, research collaborations uh, with the Census Bureau that are being implemented in the uh, 2020 decennial of um, population and housing. So this is the list of the people who did all the hard work. Um, and so the disclaimer, so I'm here as an academic researcher, so all the statements, uh, conclusions, and so on in this talk are my own. They're not official policy of the Census Bureau. So I'll talk, uh, uh, introduce the problem. We'll talk about uh, the two main challenges we're, we have to deal with, which we call schema extension and invariance. And I'll discuss uh, the details of the top-down algorithm that was used in the eight, uh, 2018 and twin test. And then a long-standing question about uh, which version of differential privacy we should be used. So uh, a few slides on that at the end. So if I use any acronym like DAS, uh, it's the Disclosure Avoidance System. That's the formal name for the uh, differential privacy module that we'll be running. So our goal is to publish a histogram using billions of cells using formal privacy. So the, the cell has a lot of attributes. One of them is location, which is hierarchical. So as John mentioned, we have national level, state, county, tract, block group, which is a collection of blocks, uh, and then finally at the block. So there are roughly 6 million blocks in the data we're developing on. Ethnicity has two variables, race 63. Um, we're looking at whether someone is voting age or not, so there are two values there. And then there's also a residence type, which is does the person live in a household or do they live in a group quarters? If they live in a group quarters, we provide this uh, group quarters code, which uh, so total is eight, value, eight uh, values there. So fortunately for us, the workload is hierarchical. Basically, at every unit of geography, we have counting queries about the demographics there. So for example, if you look at uh, this PL94171 file from 2010, it contains redistricting data uh, and advanced group quarters. Uh, summary files contains additional information about people who live in group quarters. These are the first uh, few tables that we were targeting with, with the algorithm. <coughs> so property of the data, it's very sparse. If you multiply it out, there are roughly 12 billion cells. And if you count everyone, right, around 309 million people, if you want the exact number, John will tell you. <laughs> so our query workload has about 641 non-identity queries per geo unit. So overall, uh, with all the levels of aggregation, we have, we have 3.6 billion queries. And then we also have the identity queries. So for every demographic category, how many people have that? So that's roughly 12 billion there. And this ensures that when we set epsilon to infinity, we recover the original data. <coughs> OK, so the formal notion of privacy we're using currently is differential privacy. Um, so I'm assuming most of you are familiar with this. Uh, so basically, we're looking at bounded differential privacy, meaning that we know the total number of people that's going to be fixed. And uh, the notion of what differs between two databases is we're allowing one page of the census questionnaire um, which is basic information about one person. We're allowing one of those uh, changes. If you're interested in the questionnaire, you can look at summary file one, and at the end, in one of the appendices, they have the actual questionnaire. So uh, some things to note about this definition. We actually have multiple tables. So there is uh, a person's level table, a household's level table, a group quarters table, and a geographic boundaries table. So the person's uh, table is uh, demographics about each person. One person affects one row. So if they change their census questionnaire, they change uh, that row. Then we have a households table, which uh, talks about the people in a household. What is the household type? What is the race of the householder? And in here, one person can modify one row, but only in a bounded way. Okay, so they can't completely modify a household because that depends on the rest of the people there. So in particular, this is different from a lot of relational models for differential privacy, especially Uber's model. So I think that, that's uh, something worth noting here. Uh, we have a group quarters table, which is very similar to the households table, except different questions are asked about uh, group quarters populations. And then finally, there are ge geographic boundaries. Those are defined in collaboration with states. And while they do depend on people, we treat that as uh, something that doesn't have any protection. Any questions? So if you have questions, just feel free to ask. And if I'm running out of time, I'll ignore them. Um, OK, so here are our requirements. 
we have to create microdata. Okay. <coughs> so the reason we have to create microdata is first, it means that all of the tables, all the summary statistics we create are gonna be consistent with each other. You're not gonna get two different answers uh, for the same query by looking at two different tables. Um, uh, another reason is the output of our system goes into a tabulation system and it expects microdata. So that's the format we create. So microdata is a little bit hard to work with, but it's essentially equivalent to a histogram with non-negative integer counts. So when I say histogram, I'm referring both to the histogram itself and also to the microdata. Okay. So one thing to note here is non-negative integer counts are some things that a lot of the literature ignored, but it's a crucial property for us. Um, in terms of practical things, we have a time limit. The whole system has to run within a certain number of days. So we're implementing it in Spark, which uh, has its own challenges. We're using uh, the cloud. And instead of uh, writing our own um, optimizer routines, we're actually using uh, commercial grade optimizers. <coughs> okay, so two challenges we have. One is we have to run our system before all of the data are available. So because uh, some surveys are complex and there's a lot goes on before we even uh, see the data for disclosure control, we're first gonna see the redistricting data first. We're gonna have to create uh, a differentially private version of that. Then we're going to get more data, and we'll have to create a differentially private version of summary file one, which will have to be consistent with uh, PL94. Then there's going to be an URL rural update, which has a little bit more information, and there, that's not the end. There's going to uh, be a lot more tabulations that come after this. Okay, so in addition to creating the data piecemeal, we have to be consistent with external pieces of knowledge, and I'll discuss what this means a little bit later. So we have to be consistent with external part of knowledge, and with our prior releases. Okay, so there's some data sets that are effectively public. Uh, one of them is called the Luca data set, which contains um, well the address list that Census is gonna be using. So in particular for us, that means that the number of housing units in every block is known. The number of group quarters of each type in every block is essentially known. Um, these are, so one decision we have is that the number of occupied group quarters facilities in each block is assumed to be known and invariant. So our published data has to be consistent with this information. One of the reasons for consistency of policy decisions, another is to make sure that people trust the data because if you have two separate sources of information giving completely different results, um, well, that in increases trust issues. Okay, so some information is just gonna be declared public as a policy decision. In 2010, uh, the population in each block was an invariant. The number of occupied housing units uh, in each block was inv an invariant. Um, and then if you know that the number of occupied housing units corresponds to the number of householders, you know that the number of householders in each block is considered an invariant. Later on, I'll give you a link to some reading, and if you want to figure out more invariants, you can deduce them uh, from that document. So basically, we have this term invariants. These are queries in the, truth, in the data that have to have the same answer in the differentially private data that we create. So our algorithms are still differentially private, um, but this changes the privacy semantics because we have to account for releasing the invariants along with uh, releasing the differentially private summaries. So the privacy semantics become very awkward. We've been working on a paper for it seems like years. It's been rewritten many times and we're still not very happy with it. Um, but aside from the semantics part, uh, the computational problems become NP complete. <coughs> okay, so those are invariants. We have uh, another um, name for restrictions on the data that don't depend on the actual data set itself, and these are structural zeros. Um, it's not always a good term. Some, I mean, it's called structural zeros because some counts are supposed to be zero. For example, we can't have any householders that are under 14. But other structural properties like the number of householders is greater than or equal to number of spouses and unmarried partners of householders, right, has to hold in the data. Yes? Oh, sorry to interrupt you. Um, could you just say a sentence about what do you mean by privacy semantics? Okay. <clears throat> so I have differentially, so I have a, a data set. And then I compute, I have a differential, pri differentially private computation over it. And I can release the output. But at the same time, the same entity might be releasing additional information. For example, if we release the exact number of people in each block, right. what does that mean for your privacy when we combine both of those together? 
Right? It's a composition between differential privacy and a non-differentially private uh, computation. Okay, so, um, so let's talk about these two well-defined problems. So the first one we call incremental schema extension. Okay, so basically we create microdata that's at, um, through a differentially private process and then we add columns to it, also uh, satisfying uh, epsilon differential privacy. So for example, suppose we start with a table. We create uh, just a national statistics about race, ethnicity, and voting age status, whether someone is voting age or not. Okay. Later on, we can tack on the state attributes. So we can, for all of these uh, differentially private people, we create, we add a state, and then later on, we add a county to them, uh, and so on. Okay. So th this is the kind of problem that we're trying to solve. It's necessary first because we don't have all of the information available at once, um, but it's also useful for scalability. So if we take all of the, um, well, the full schema, so all of the columns we eventually want to tack on. It's just not going to fit in memory. So the common, uh, the common paradigm for a differentially private algorithm is first create measurements, so uh, noisy estimates of, of for queries, and then post-process them to create the microdata. So this optimization problem is not going to fit into main memory if we try to do everything at once. Okay. The second problem is consistency with external knowledge. So external knowledge means we have some information about the full uh, histogram that we want to create at the end. But we're making it piecemeal. So when we create this and then we start adding columns, we want to make sure that when we create this data, we can always extend it to a full table that will satisfy all of the constraints. Okay. And this decision problem, what we created, can it be extended, is NP-complete in general. OK, so because the invariance causes so many headaches, um, that's actually where we spend most of our time on. We're going to talk about uh, just the general framework for how we add columns and then later on add in the invariance. Okay, so as I said earlier, the histogram is way too big to fit in memory. We have to create it in pieces. So what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, person level demographics at the national level and create a non-negative integer histogram. Okay. Once we do that, then we're going to create non-negative integer histograms of, of demographics at each state. And then we have to have a consistency requirement that when you add up the demographics from every state, you get the national level histogram. Uh, once we do that, then we recursively create the county level histograms, the tract level histograms, block group, and block level histograms. So our hierarchy has six levels. Um, so since there are you know, 50 states plus DC, so we, we typically say 51 states, and then uh, around 3,000 counties, and then 6 million blocks, the number of optimization problems we have to solve increases as we go down the hierarchy. But um, the size of the optimization problems decrease because when we see that something is sparse at a state level, we inherit that sparsity when we push it down to the county level. So variables that are zero at some point will stay zero, and that allows us to create fewer variables um, and to do all of this efficiently. Okay. All right, so the total US population is not protected, and that is a crucial part of the first step of our algorithm. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our population level uh, true histogram. We're going to have uh, a workload for the, you can think of these as the PL94 tables or the SF1 population tables. And we use uh, a new technique called the high dimensional matrix mechanism to find out which linear queries we should ask that will allow us to estimate these answers most accurately. Okay. So we're going to get this uh, query work, uh, these strategy queries. We're going to apply them to the true histogram, add some noise to satisfy differential privacy, and then we're going to have noisy measurements. So what we're going first going to do to create the national level histogram is solve this optimization problem. So we want to create this um, synthetic microdata H star such that it uh, answers the queries almost uh, exactly almost matches the noisy query answers, subject to some constraints, like we have this uh, population total invariant, and we ha it has to be non-negative. Okay. Right now, I left out the integer part. So this solve is very fast, and it gives us a non-negative fractional histogram of population demographics. And then we need to convert it into an integer histogram, so we round it using a linear program, um, which is equivalent to this. So basically, we have our fractional counts, we want to create this new histogram 
with integers that doesn't uh, deviate from, too much from it. Uh, it has to be non-negative. We want to make it rounding so that we bound uh, how much each cell can differ. Um, and then finally, we want to make sure that for every demographics um, combination, yeah, a little bug here. But basically, for every demographics combination has to um, add Oh, okay, that the total number of people has to be the same. Okay. And previously we set this to be the actual population of the United States, which was an integer, so this becomes feasible. Uh, so if you write this out, um, the constraint matrix is totally unimodular. We're going to be repeating this a lot. Uh, so because it's TUM, we have uh, integer feasibility. And instead of making this uh, an integer program, we can actually use linear programming techniques to solve it. So uh, Gorobi is using barrier plus uh, crossover to, to solve this problem. But just to be safe, we do ask Gorobi to solve it as an integer program, um, but it's fast because of, of this property. Questions so far? Yes. Yeah, instead of uh, sort of making these, non, uh, these counts uh, to be real numbers by adding noise, you might think of a different algorithm which uses the ex uh, sort of a discretized Laplace. Did you think of that? And then you're only adding integers to these numbers. Yes, we did. Um, that's a good question. So we could, uh, you know, we have our query workload. Which these are all counting queries. And we can use the geometric mechanism to answer them. But if we want to get more accuracy, we actually use the high dimensional matrix mechanism, which gives us a different set of queries to ask. And to get differential privacy here, so the coefficients of these queries are real numbers, not integers. And then we have to use the Laplace mechanism. Okay. Even if we didn't use this, the fact that we want this constraint over here already means that we might be getting non-integer solutions. Yeah, but if you, if you, you could always, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're, uh, uh, go back to the previous slide. Uh, so if you're, uh, Ac uh, accuracy metric is the total variation distance. Why do you use the L2 distance uh, for your optimization problem? OK. Um, so it's our, we're evolving our, optim our metrics for, for accuracy. So the total L1 distance is just one number. We can present to policy people. But it's, we're, um, yeah, so, so we're constantly improving it. Second, the reason we're doing L2 solve, there are two reasons. One is it's fast. And the other is, at least this one is guaranteed to put the queries together to minimize, to reduce the variance compared to, um, compared to this. Right, so, so if, if you forget about this non-negativity constraint, it's provable that the queries answered from here have lower variance than, than this. All right. Um, so where are we? OK, so, so then we round. And then we recurse down the states. So we have a non-negative integer histogram at the national level. We want to do the same thing for the state. So first, anything that is 0 at the national level stays 0. And so we don't have to create variables in our optimization problem. So for each state, we use HDMM again to find the queries to ask. We add noise. And so now we have a set of measurements for every state. And we have similar, but not exactly the same, uh, solve process. So first a linear square, linear, um, a least square solve followed by a linear optimization problem. Okay. So we have our national level histogram that's fixed now. We have our state level measurements. And so we want to create uh, measurements at fractional histograms at each state that answer, that whose query answers match these pretty closely and that add up to the national histogram. So we solve this optimization problem, basically minimize the distance between the noisy measurements and uh, the answers from our synthetic um, histograms. And this last constraint is uh, the consistency constraint. The states have to add up to the national level. OK. So again, we round it using a linear program, same as before, except we have this added constraint that the states, the integer state uh, solutions have to add up to the integer uh, national solution. OK, questions? Yes. Um, in the fractional problem, do you, does 
the variance increase for any queries because of this non-negative projection? It, it's hard to say. Um, we, we definitely notice a bias when we aggregate over other types of queries. Maybe I shouldn't say variance. I should say maybe error or something. It, it's the bias. The bias is increasing right. because you know, some, if something is zero, the only thing it could do is move up to, to the positive. So we're exploring um, how to deal with that. Yeah. That, that's a, definitely a big issue. All right, and then uh, we recurse. So now that we have um, state level uh, demographics histograms, we can process them independently. So for each state, we generate its county level measurements and then do our solves to create the county level histograms. And then once we get, uh, once we have the county specs, then we do the tracts, uh, the block groups, the blocks. Once it's at the block level, we uh, convert it back into microdata. So overall, this whole process takes about uh, 20,000 th 20, uh, lines of code. Uh, plus another 60,000 more supporting code to glue it into the rest of the system. Okay. But that's not um, everything. So like I said, most of our time is spent dealing with invariance. So basically the final data, once we've created it with all of its fields, has to satisfy um, mostly linear constraints. Oh, sorry, can I just ask a question on the previous one? The, uh, when you talk about the histograms there, did you... You start off with all those other um, columns, all of them at the very start, like the, the ethnicity and the race and the um, uh, voting age. Is that right? Or um, so, as well as you go? so th this is roughly what we started with, okay. and then we started. Then we added the states, counties. Okay, so once we add everything, we have some linear constraints that have to be satisfied. Um, and so, so again, we have to worry about, if you publish some exact statistics about the data, what does it do to the privacy semantics? And then how do we make the algorithm enforce those constraints? Okay, so in both, um, in both cases, it's complicated. So just to give you an idea of some of the problems we've been dealing with, Here's a very simple example. Suppose we're just look, looking at a two-level geographic hierarchy, and we're only interested in whether people live in, let's say, a, a male-only dorm, female-only dorm, or a co-ed dorm. Okay. So we have a small college town. Uh, there are two regions. We have some aggregate statistics for a number of people in each dorm type, and we have their differentially private counterparts. And our question is, given this, can we extend it at region information so that it's consistent with uh, public knowledge? In this example, the knowledge is that each region, over here 100 students, 100 students, they all live in dorms. All dorms are occupied. Um, first region has uh, zero male-only dorms, and the second region has zero female-only dorms. Okay. This is the simplest example we could find that has uh, some of these uh, weird properties. So like I said, we created these differentially private counts. We want to extend it uh, to the region. So our question is, are these counts that we generated consistent with background knowledge? Okay. So let's talk about what would this mean. So obviously, um, these will have to have some restrictions. We can't have arbitrary counts. Okay. So we can say, well, all right, so we know that there is one male-only dorm. Uh, one female only dorm and two co-ed dorms. All of them are occupied. So clearly we should have at least one person living in a male only dorm, at least one in a female only dorm, at least two in co-ed, and total population is 200. Okay. So these are, uh, I guess, rather straightforward, but the question is, are we done? Um, and it turns out this is not quite correct. So suppose we had these kind of counts, which satisfy all the constraints lift, uh, listed above. Okay. So if you think about it, this is incorrect for a subtle reason. There's only one male-only dorm over here. Population of this region is 100. And so we cannot have 101 uh, people living in male-only dorms if we want to extend this to be consistent with here. Okay. So it's not valid. Um, the reason is that the different constraints um, Oh, well, they interact in ways that are not very nice. So we have several hammers for solving these problems. One is to use Fourier Motzkin elimination, which allows us to automate them um, sometimes. Uh, so for example, these constraints, 
we proved automatically uh, for, for these counts in order to allow them to be extended to this region. Another way is network flows. So network flows is also a nice hammer, but it doesn't apply in all uh, situations. You can uh, reduce the problem to a network flow problem by getting rid of all the greater or equal to some constant constraints, setting them to here. Use the max flow uh, min cut theorem, analyze the cuts, and come up with uh, essentially the same constraints as here. Okay. So we can formalize this problem as we have a schema that we start with, which is basically a set of table columns. We have a superset of it, which is the extended schema. We have a table satisfying the, the first scheme. We have a table, microdata table, that satisfies uh, the first schema. And we'd like to generate a table T that satisfies the larger schema. Okay. We're given a set of constraints on this larger table. For example, the total population in each region, uh, the presence and absence of occupied dorms. And we want to figure out what does C imply about T0. Okay. So we have a constraint C, set of constraints that this thing, this T0 has to uh, satisfy. And our question is, how do we find them? Okay. So we have, uh, basically, we can't have arbitrary constraints. We have to have C0 has to be necessary and sufficient. So if um, basically something on the, true tab on the entire table is true, then it must be true on the projection, with T0 as the projection of the full table. And uh, conversely, if something is true on this, there has to exist an extension. All right, so the question is, how do we find them? In general, this is NP-complete, even if we have a schema with two attributes and um, another, and the full table has uh, three attributes. Okay, you can probably see that you can easily encode a three-sat problem this way. Um, but three-set problems can be nasty sometimes. It turns out that even if you have some really well-behaved, nice-looking constraints, such as marginals, two uh, one-way marginals in each region, this becomes NP-complete as long as the number of regions is three or more, and it's NP-complete in the number of rows and columns. Okay, so that's the bad news. But the good news is uh, we have a tool, for a Matskin Elimination, which will automatically uh, generate our constraints. It, it does have um, some not very nice complexity. Uh, and the other problem is it gives us uh, linear constraints. So we know that there is a fractional extension. We're not always sure that there's an integer extension. Usually we have to prove this by hand or use some uh, arguments with network flows to do that. Okay. So let's uh, put everything together. So we want to generate a national level differentially private histogram, but we have some implied constraints that we generate through various means about what national level statistics, have, what constraints they have to satisfy in order for us to be able to extend it by adding additional columns and geographies. So we get our noisy measurements. We set up first our L2 solve. The only difference is we added some more conditions that our implied constraints have to be satisfied. All right. Then we have our rounding solve, which again, we take our linear solve and add these constraints. Okay. So we ask Gorobi to solve this as an integer problem, but it uses linear programming techniques, if the, essentially if this, is, um, if this matrix is totally unimodular. So in most of our cases, we do have a, a TUM matrix. And sometimes, we're not quite sure if it's TUM, but given our objective function on the right-hand side, it seems that they're nice enough to give us integer solutions. OK, so basically, implied constraints, we deduce partially by hand and then verify using automated techniques. We have the L2 solve followed by the L1 solve. Um, so in some cases, we have nice constraints. Uh, integer optimal solutions exist, and we can find them uh, quickly. Sometimes the solve is very slow. Uh, in these cases, we think that it extends to a, a TUM, uh, to a TUM problem, but not quite sure yet. Okay. So the example of the of the ones where the solve is the slow is the one that I showed you before. It's we have. Group quarters type, uh, occupied group quarters uh, of different types in different regions. So in general, in, um, 
the census, uh, uh, when we want to publish PL94 and SF1, the GQ is going to have, the group quarters are going to have three digit codes that are, might be invariant, so I can't say for sure, but that's the way um, it seems right now. It's similar to the college dorm uh, example, but instead of having three types of group quarters, there are 28 types, and then they have subtypes because they have restrictions on age uh, and, and who can live there. Okay. So the implied constraints that we generate are quite big, so 2 to 28 of them in the general case. Uh, we don't think that all of them are necessary, so if we use network flow, we can actually reduce this number uh, substantially. So the constraints basically look like um, for every combi combination of group quarters, so S is a combination of group quarters, we look at uh, the total population of group quarters uh, who live in GQs of this type, and it has to be bounded by a constant C, which we have to compute from the data. Okay, so when we look at this, the constraint matrix is not uh, totally unimodular, but using network flows, we can prove that we get integer solutions. Okay, and then you might be asking me, well, if you have network flows, why isn't it TUM? And it's because our constraints are on the capacities of the edges rather than just encoding the network structure. Okay. So in general, the, um, can, the invariants that we've been asked to look at, they, they keep changing. And sometimes they're slow, sometimes they're fast, sometimes we don't know how to do them. So we have some backup strategies uh, just in case. So our, our, final, our last line of defense is called the fail-safe. And basically, if a solve fails at some point, uh, for example, let's say we're generating county-level histograms and we just cannot find a feasible solution, what we're going to do is we're going to drop the requirement that everything adds up to the parent. So we're going to drop the requirement that the population totals in each demographic category add up to the, um, the state-level uh, or county-level population. Okay. Instead, we're going to use a weaker requirement where some linear queries have to match the parent, um, but not every uh, query. Okay. So once we do this, we generate the children, and then we recompute the county based on the sum of the tracts. Okay. So we found that this uh, is not very good for accuracy, but it does maintain the invariance. The other approach is the minimal schema approach, and the goal of that is to find the smallest set of attributes that cover all of the invariants and the geography. So if we find those, and then adding other columns that are not involved in the invariants would be easy. So if this uh, problem with all levels of geography can fit in memory, then we can just do it in one pass, and we don't have to worry about implied constraints, and then we can start extending uh, the other ones. Okay. And then finally, there's uh, another approach which is in between these two, and that we note that not all constraints are necessary. And so one standard uh, integer programming technique is to use cutting planes. So we have multiple solves to find the right constraints that we need. All right, so we've explored many invariants. The actual choice of the invariants is a policy decision. So our job is just to support them uh, and give uh, advice, basically saying, how does this affect privacy semantics? And what happens to our ability to actually generate data that satisfy those constraints? The current set of invariants that we are looking at right now is that the state population totals are invariant for um, the purposes of apportionment. The number of occupied group quarters facilities of each type, so the 28 types, in each block is invariant. The total number of housing units is invariant. So some of them might be vacant, some of them might be occupied, but the total is invariant. And then we have some auxiliary information about group quarters. Uh, some of them have age restrictions, for example, nursing homes. Some of them uh, have sex restrictions, like female only, male only, or co-ed. And then we have a bunch of structural zeros, like the ones I mentioned earlier. Okay. If you're interested in what happened in 2010 and earlier, here's a link for the disclosure avoidance discussion from which you can infer additional invariants that were used in 2010. Okay. Questions? All right. So there have been some questions about why are we using pure differential privacy rather than um, concentrated or any differential privacy? Um, that is a good question. So there are some technical issues and some policy issues that make it a little bit hard, but we are planning to explore it. 
So right now, basically, we're using uh, pure DP with Laplace noise, sometimes uh, geometric mechanism. We're planning some experiments with RDP and DCDP. But for uh, some initial setup for the experiments and some initial findings, uh, some numerical findings are, first, we'd like the numerical probability to be really small. Uh, basically, if you think of the classical um, approximate differentially private algorithm that with some probability chooses a random record and releases it, we want to minimize that prob probability of that happening. So if you think of it as a roughly um, 400 million people and we want one in a million chance of releasing anyone's record, we would be setting epsilon delta, uh, delta sorry, uh, to something really small. Okay. Uh, if we wanted to use moment accountant um, and split the privacy budget equally across the six levels of our geographic hierarchy, these are roughly um, the variances that we get for different settings of epsilons. So currently, it looks like uh, the Laplace variance would be smaller than the Gaussian variance for equivalent epsilons. OK, but um, even though the Gaussian variance is larger than the Laplace, the tails are smaller. And if the tails are smaller, we're going to have fewer outliers in the sense of fewer large noise values. And that can affect our post-processing steps. Um, it also affects some of the uh, error measures if we don't look at variance, but if we look at other ones. Um, another possibility is that the query workload might be better tuned for RDP than for Laplace noise because we'd be looking at uh, L2 sensitivity instead of L1 sensitivity. So we are planning experiments. Um, so these, the numbers say we're not too optimistic, but uh, something could improve. Um, and then, of course, we also have a lot of other things to do. So I don't know what is the time frame for getting these done. OK, so we have lots of time for questions. So, you know, in the problem with the GQs, aren't there real numbers behind that? Why aren't you just adding noise to those? And then once you've produced this microdata, you can throw the whole thing in a Caligula Holt uh, editing system with the Foyer Mutzkin uh, eliminations. Okay. Um, it looks like you were sort of making up data in your example. You had the, you know, yes. the so, well. That empty, but you knew the margins. But there must be real counts underlying those. Yeah, OK, so I, I, I will not put up real data here. So, so it is made up. No. But we, we had the same issues where we had the wrong constraints uh, and our solves failed. Okay. We could uh, you know, just do whatever and then have the post-processing step later. But then it's much harder to optimize. Okay. So the, the accuracy uh, could suffer. It's, all, it's a really large scale problem that's sometimes best to handle piecewise. So uh, I guess that maybe this is also a question for John, but uh, have you, is there a decision at the census that what will ultimately be released is only the final result of the, that, the processing or also the kind of raw, noisy measurements that were made at each step? Because I could imagine that there might be um, Advances as as you know, over the next ten years, for example, people might find other ways of post-processing post those measurements, for, or want to play with other ways of post-processing those measurements. I can answer the non-policy version of that question. Sure. <laughs> so we are planning to save the noise, and in addition to better post-processing, another thing we can do with differential privacy is, if after five years we decide it's okay to allocate more privacy budget to it and increase the accuracy. We don't generate fresh noise. We can use techniques like noise down to make the existing queries more accurate. We have a question. I have a question. I didn't understand on uh, RDP and the CDP. Um, so I imagine one of the advantages you can have is uh, Composition. You said something, but I didn't uh, follow why you don't expect that it's better. Okay, so this accounts the advanced composition. Oh, this okay. accounts for it. So we split it across six levels. I mean, if we just looked at the national level histograms, the full privacy budget, these would look so much more favorable to Laplace. But because we have six levels of uh, geographic hierarchy, 
we have advanced composition uh, using moment account versus just uh, normal composition for Laplace. And, and so this is what the numbers look like right now. Yeah, so the advanced composition helps when you have many, many levels of composition. So the number of levels is very small, so it tends yes, to be really like much. Yeah, so, so the other benefit, right, is in the tails. Yeah. And that, that's something that could help us. But you could, you could use the Laplace and then control the tails with the delta. Uh, well, okay, so that will put us into approximate uh, differential privacy, not RDP, because now we're actually having this event where something bad happens. Um, plus the, but the moment account works differently for Laplace than for Gaussian. That, that's the other issue. So the, it seems that the, the delta you're picking here is uh, it's quite small, and in particular, RDP, CDP algorithms don't actually uh, output records with some probability. So just wondering what would happen if you picked a more reasonable delta value. Well, you can pick a delta so that RDP does better. <laughs> uh, that's a short answer. Um, the longer answer is the privacy semantics right now for ZCDP and RDP, right? They're all based on approximate differential privacy. Right, so if you had better ways of setting the parameters, I mean, this is just the, the default. This is what the literature says. If you had better ways of setting it, we could, uh, again, choose to the parameters in a better way. But it has to be explainable to policy people. It's the hot they, they, no integrals. For <laughs> <laughs> just to add to that, I think the, it was not very sensitive. These numbers are not too sensitive, as long as the delta was sufficiently small. And so. But uh, I think it's fair to, to say that uh, look, one possible interpretation of this of epsilon delta to RDP uh, is that with probability one minus delta, your privacy is better than blah. And uh, from that perspective, it's meaningful to look at deltas, which is 50%, 10%, 1%. So if we, can't, it's, um, we can't set delta to 0 0.01 and say that 99% of people will enjoy privacy, which is better than whatever we output. No, 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 how, how, do you go, how do you go from that? Like, delta equal 1% doesn't say anything about 99% of the people, right? That's a leap. <clears throat> what, what do I mean? It's like, just because delta is 0.01 doesn't mean that 99% of the people will enjoy different privacy, 1% is not. Well, it's, I, I, thank you for, for the correction. With probability 99%, uh, any given person will enjoy better privacy than blah. Uh, you're correct. It's not. Uh, it's probability uh, of, of of a privacy loss event for any single person. Mm -hmm. right. 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 So, so I think I think the catch here is basically that's a true statement, right? Uh, but the kind of semantics that people want to hear are, are like the simulation argument, where you're saying that. Uh, for any attacker with any prior, right, the, 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 the privacy, uh, the, the additional loss in privacy, uh, addition risk in disclosing some, some event is blah, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that kind of an equivalence has been shown from RDP to something that, to that simulation argument. So for any fixed prior, you can make this argument. Okay. So we, we would definitely like to talk to you guys and figure that out because I, you, yeah, that, that's, the, that's the catch. Right? That's the catch of us. So I think we can talk about this for hours. So we can talk about this for hours. So let me just say, challenge for you and Tom Thomas is to give us better semantics. Uh, so right now, just explaining epsilon is very hard. And you're saying, we'll just have this graph for every epsilon. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 we should talk about this definitely. Yeah, it'll be great if we can no, get a similar. Yeah. And if a person would just said delta to be one over the number of experiments that you run, or the number of, you know. You don't have to convince me. You have to convince <laughs> no, 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 okay. policy people, and that's the problem. But we are set up to run with RDP because we just need to change our query workload and our accounting for the privacy loss. Mm. Right, and some of this discussion may be also useful for the panel tomorrow on uh, setting the parameters. So maybe we can defer some to them, and we can uh, thank you again, uh, Dan. For the